Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks to the Anaphylaxis campaign for having me here. It's a great uh, pleasure and privilege. Um, some familiar faces. No, have I got any fellow GPs in the audience? Yes. Brilliant. You get very used to being the only one in, in the sort of allergy thing. And, I, and part of that's what I'd like to talk about today, because a lot of you will have come across GPs, and to paraphrase Tom Lira, wondered how they got that way. So we're going to just work through that and talk about how GPs are beginning to engage. And we've had a really positive thing over the last few years. Lynn's talked about the AIM program and a whole load of things that have been going out to general practice. But I just thought we'd look at what's happened, and certainly what's happened since I first started getting involved in allergy. So the unmet need, um, a lot of you who've been involved will know about these papers, Allergy, the Unmet Need from 2003, the more recent one in 2010, talking about how we were essentially failing our patients in the NHS. We weren't giving them the services they need and as a result often driving them towards seeking alternative diagnoses, the diagnoses that may have been questionable in how they were done. If you can't see a specialist and if your own local doctor doesn't know what to say to help you, quite natural to go and seek something else. But the unmet need is a term that rings quite true with GPs because we use this a lot in our training, certainly in training young GPs. We have this concept of puns and dens. Now, the pun is the patient's unmet need, which leads to the doctor's educational need. Because in general practice, we see pretty much everything for every speciality. We've got patients coming in with things that fall completely outside of medicine. So we have unmet needs from patients. And that can lead to us thinking, well, I don't know much about that, so I need to educate myself about that. And that's very much what drove me to become interested in allergy, because I've seen lots of patients who had lots of allergic problems, and I had had no training to really help them. Because the training, certainly when I started, was a very, very big issue. When we train GPs, we have this kind of jack-of-all-trades role. We do specialise. We are specialists in general practice, which you know us GPs always like to point out it is a speciality in its own right. Um, but we, we have to do a little bit of everything. And that can be quite difficult. And it can limit us, because we can only know a little bit about everything. We can't be specialists in every field. So it's very important that when we're training our young GPs who are coming through, that we train from practicality. I was trained through diseases, so you'd learn about rheumatology, and you'd learn about respiratory, you'd learn about ENT, and you'd have all these things separated out, which meant that the allergic patient who had rhinitis and asthma and food allergy and eczema was falling into about four categories, whereas it was one patient. If we train out of practicality, if we say, if this patient comes in with this, we need to think about this as well, it's a much better way of doing things, and indeed that's how it's now progressed. If we don't train in that way, we get these bizarre behaviours, and certainly a lot of these were rife when I was, um, when I was first starting out as a GP. And just to run down this short list, salbutamol, um, <coughs> common response, yes, how many would you like? Ten? Okay. Oh, ten again this month. Oh, getting through those pretty quickly, aren't you? You know, we weren't often paying attention to the obvious and easy signals that our patients were giving us. Um, Auto-injectors oh, no, don't you think you should get secondary care to prescribe that? I, you know, I'm not sure, about, not sure about how to do that. You should go back to the clinic and ask for one of those. We weren't trained. No one was telling us at the RCGP or when we were doing our GP registrar time, this is an auto-injector. You are going to have to prescribe them. Therefore, you're going to need to know how to use it because you're going to have to inform patients. We were being given that with salbutamol. And bearing in mind, I became a GP about 2005, so we're not talking about that long ago. Um, the hydrolyzed formulas, that was a great one. It started people coming through saying, I need more formula. GP, well, how many tins do I give? How quickly do you get through it? And then it got even worse because the CCGs got involved and said, we're prescribing far too many of these. They're very expensive, so we're going to limit our patients on how many they can have. And we had some very interesting local guidance coming through from time to time saying two a month or something like that, which made life fair. And I'm sure a lot of you here have experienced that problem that patients have had with those uh, preparations. And then my favourite at the bottom, um, Kenalog. Anyone know what Kenalog is? 
It's an injection of steroid. Uh, it used to be, you know, it's hay fever season. I've come for my hay fever injection. Oh, I'll just inject you with this enormous dose of steroid and reinforce the behavior, and that's what you need every single year to get you through the season. And I won't really worry about what it's doing to your bones or your risk of diabetes or anything else. It's nice and easy, nice and quick for me to do. So there were all these behaviors that had come out of lack of training for GPs. And fortunately, they were already beginning to change when I started. But a lot of them are still, and certainly my fellow GPs here may recognize some of these uh, even today. So it's complexity. That's the problem. As GPs, we, we have the patient coming in with multiple problems, not just one problem, across all specialities. I took the liberty of uh, printing this off. This is one of my patients, Mr. Mickey Mouse. Um, who came in for his 10 minutes appointment recently. As you can see, a number of problems discussed. And it would be very easy at the bottom, if you look all the way down, to see the asthma review, because he's run out of inhalers yet again and needs another six subutamol inhalers without any detail. Now, QOF, which has been mentioned earlier, the Quality Outcomes Framework, it, which is kind of wearing, we're, we're sort of losing QOF now. But since 2004, it's been a big way of how GPs are incentivized for best practice. Doing asthma reviews is part of that, but it can be a tick box. It's just putting a code in to say, I have reviewed the patient and I've done a few other things. It didn't necessarily incentivize doing it well. So the newer things we've got coming through are much more exciting. We'll touch on that in a little while. So GP, 2005, I'd done about a decade of hospital medicine prior to that. Uh, wanted to stay a generalist, really liked seeing patients, became a GP. And at the time, the RCGP curriculum didn't really, when you were doing the exam, have anything to do with allergy. Hay fever was mentioned under ENT, asthma, of course, very much there under respiratory. Food allergy, no real mention at all. Again, only about 11 years ago. Eczema, that was there under dermatology. So you kind of touched on these things. But the new curriculum is much better, and there's an even newer model coming out. The most recent version has these two papers, being a general practitioner of 59 pages, and then the professional and clinical modules, all 343 pages of it, which I have read so that you don't have to, and you can thank me later for that. But if we go through it, um, in the 343 pages, the word allergy turns up 12 times, five of which are reference to the unmet need paper. Another uh, five are references to the BSACI website, which uh, my BSACI colleagues will be pleased to see. Uh, there is an ENT case discussion, which is excellent, which mentions rhinitis and asthma, and that's very, very good. And then there's a reference to an RCGP nutrition module regarding um, food allergy. Asthma comes up a bit more, but only because it references Asthma UK and the BTS sign guidelines quite a number of times. Eczema comes up eight times. It doesn't reference anything, but it, it mainly stresses the importance as a GP of working as part of a team, working with our nursing team, with our health visitors, you know, everyone who might be involved in that patient's care. So these things, these things are mentioned, but they're sort of brief and scant mentions. Food allergy isn't mentioned at all, apart from the reference that you can go and look at the nutritional module. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, for me as a GP, the words nutritional module don't <laughs> pull me in, but um, it, is, it is basically mentioned. And then at the bottom, anaphylaxis is mentioned once in the 343 pages of be able to recognize it. I, I would hope so. You know. So in 2009, when I started thinking, I've got this unmet need for my patients, I need an educational solution, I you know, was having a look to see what I could do about it. And the answer is I couldn't do much because there wasn't really an awful lot out there. It actually wasn't as bad as this. There were two places I could go and study. Um, either at Imperial or Southampton, both of which offered courses. Um, Imperial at the time was the one that was recruiting, so uh, I was lucky enough to get on the course there and be taught by some absolutely amazing people. Um, but it has improved. So I did this the other day. It just goes on for pages and pages of online stuff that GPs can source. And that's fantastic. I, you know, that's only in a matter of seven, eight years. We've, we've come so far with online education, most of which is entirely free and accessible, and most of which is really, really good as well. So it's a huge leap forward. Since 2009, we've had a lot of progress in guidelines. We GPs love guidelines. 
We, we love to read everything NICE sends us, which we do, yeah, full document every time, uh, all in detail. Um, but we've had the food allergy guidance, which had um, Joe Walsh as the GP representative. We've had the anaphylaxis guideline. We've had the drug allergy guideline. We've had quality standards, anaphylaxis and food allergy. As was mentioned earlier on, those were sent out with the AIM documentation only in the last year, I think, to all GPs, Lynn, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So th these have really been put in, the, in, in front of our general practice colleagues, which is absolutely brilliant. And they've really raised the awareness of these important issues. Asthma has undone things a little bit. Um, anyone aware of the nice recent foray into designing an asthma guideline? We have the excellent BTS sign guideline, which has been around since about 2099, I can't remember when it started, has just been uh, redone, absolutely brilliant. The NICE asthma guidance came out suggesting, well, there's two parts, one with diagnosis and monitoring, which was draft from January of last year, and it suggested that all general practices should have um, exhaled nitric oxide monitoring as a way of diagnosing and monitoring. It, which is difficult. They're expensive devices. There wasn't huge consensus that was the way to go in general practice. A lot of people got quite angry about it because people like sometimes getting angry about things that NICE do. Um, and it's all now been put on hold a little bit. So that, that, that's put things back a wee bit. But then BTS and Sign have roared in with their new guidance, which is very simple and very nice. And everyone's gone fantastic. We're back on message with asthma. Um, the MAP guideline on cow's milk protein, if, if you haven't come across it, Trevor Brown's work, absolutely fantastic bit of stuff for primary care. Contains milk ladder, contains all the details you need for managing and diagnosing these patients in primary care, when to refer. It is just brilliant. And we're hopeful that there'll be more work on other allergens coming out of the MAP group um, in, in due course. But I, I thoroughly recommend, if you don't know it already, have a good look at it, because it is very easily to, easy to access. Education. Well, we've got allergy-wise, um, deliberately not mentioned allergy-wise because it's an anaphylaxis campaign day, but we've got other things as well. We've got the Allergy Academy. The BSACI have, since 2010, run primary care days. These are days that you can get funding from the BSACI and you can put on your local day. And if you fund it without any commercial interests, uh, you get a little bit more money. If you fund it with commercial interests, you get a little bit less money towards it. And there have now been 47 of them uh, across the country. They're very well received. Some of them are quite big with hundreds of delegates. Some of them are quite small with maybe 30 or 40. Um, but the, we, we've just seen increasing numbers of these primary care days going forward. We've had a primary care day at the BSACI conference which is very, very good. And I, again, if you have the option of going uh, in October of next year, I would uh, thoroughly recommend it. Um, GPs, we've, we've got the, we haven't got the final program sorted out for GPs yet, as far as I know, but that, uh, that will be on the website at some point. Um, the webinars that have been done by the BSACI are very good, and they're on YouTube. There's ones on urticaria, cow's milk with Adam Fox. Um, so, you know, if we all like to gaze at Adam um, adoringly from time to time. Uh, <laughs> And so that one's very good. We've got um, one on, uh, there's one on rhinitis, I think, lurking around there as well. And then we've got, for GPs particularly, Pulse, which is one of the GP magazines. That's got, uh, initially, it, ha it had no allergy modules on their learning platform. It's now got a whole page of them. And they're, in fact, I think, Andy, you've, you've done some of the Pulse stuff. It, they're, they're absolutely brilliant. Some of them are free. Some of them require a, a, a payment to, to access. Um, Doctors.net, again, for GPs, is, has got increasing numbers of uh, allergy uh, e-learning there. Guidelines in Practice, this is another GP magazine that comes out and reviews recent guidance and usually has a, a detailed summary, hopefully done by somebody who is involved with the guideline itself, often hopefully a GP. And that goes out and reviews the guidance and it's well um, uh, sent out to all GPs across the country and very well read and very well received. So all of these things have helped to get the message out, to, to get that educational need that I struggled with. You know, six, seven years ago, I really struggled to find the education I need. And the brilliant thing now for the GPs coming in, that, that's not a problem. Not a problem at all. 
And of course, we've got the, the brilliant Imperial and Southampton courses, which are um, increasing. I did actually email both of them before doing this talk to say, can you give me an idea of, because when I did this, I, th I think I was the only one, I think I was the only, was I the only GP, Lorraine? Because we were on it together. I think I was the only GP on it. But now lots of GPs doing this course, lots of dietitians, um, we've got nurses, it, it, absolutely brilliant courses. So what, how are we progressing in primary care? Well, there's some really good stuff now. So asthma, if we go back to the whole salbutamol inhaler thing, the giving people multiple inhalers, we know since the um, National Register of Asthma Deaths report came out a couple of years ago that that's, it's such an important signal that the patient who's churning through 12 inhalers a year is probably very poorly controlled or selling their inhalers off to people or has a dreadful technique or any of the, uh, those things combined. Most of the GP systems, I mean, the, the screenshot I showed you earlier before is from EMIS Web, which is about 60% of GP practices. There are other ones like System 1. They have these little alerts that come up. And one of the alerts we now have is if a patient has been prescribed a number of inhalers over the last 12 months, it flags up the red box saying you are seeing a patient who seems to have poorly controlled asthma. Pay attention. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. You don't even need to now look for it. It's kind of put on the screen in front of you, which is a real advance. I think will make such a simple thing, but will make a huge difference. We noticed with, um, there's a drug called methotrexate that's used for a number of conditions, immunosuppressant drug. And it, it, the dosing has to be right with methotrexate. It is essentially a chemotherapy. About five years ago, they started doing a similar thing where they just, suddenly a box would appear. Every time you tried to prescribe it, it would just say, warning, you appear to be prescribing methotrexate. Are you A, an idiot, or B, do you wish to proceed? <laughs> and, and if you did proceed, it would then let you do the prescription. But it just made you think each time about getting the dose right. And hopefully this box will have a similar effect because methotrexate may be harmed one person a year in the UK. Uh, you know, and they're often serious harm, but it, very few deaths from methotrexate. And yet we had this system in place for years. If we can apply the same salbutamol as we now are, we're going to be picking up those high-risk asthmatics. And we can do that in primary care because, of course, they're all coming to us for their prescriptions. They're all coming to us with their flares, and we're seeing them all the time. And we know them. We know them, you know, we know them by name. We know where they live. We hopefully know what their triggers are. So really, really important stuff. Eczema, lots of guidance, lots of support from our excellent dermatology nurses, our pediatric nurses who are constantly coming out to us and teach us how to wet wipes and loads of messy play. Brilliant stuff. So again, people are learning. It's no longer another 10 tubes of hydrocortisone. Suddenly it's double base and dilatum and it's emollient technique and all these important things that, again, I didn't know. But now we're all knowing, and that's the brilliant bit. Um, food allergy, cow's milk protein, great guidance. The guidance has been put out in front of GPs. We've got the quality standards. Anaphylaxis, drug allergy, much the same. Um, venom, not so much um, that's gone on in primary care. But what we are seeing is, one, a lot more specific IgE testing, blood testing, looking for allergens done by GPs across the country. And more importantly, the RCGP has, for the last three years, had a venom question in its data bank of questions for people entering to try and do the MRCGP exam. Um, it doesn't come off, of course, every exam, but it refers to a beekeeper who has a sort of escalating reaction and things you can do. So, so again, we're getting somewhere with the, um, with the examination. Testing, as I said, lots more testing. And just, I must say, a, a personal thanks, I'm sure, from many of my GP colleagues. Uh, huge support from colleagues in local allergy services who've tirelessly come out, who've helped put on primary care days, who, who've just really supported general practice to get this learning. And I, I've got to say a very personal thanks for that, because I've been very lucky to have that support from so many people. Progress with the RCGP. This, this has been the challenge for ages, um, but there is now progress. In the last couple of years, we've really got somewhere. So this year alone, the RCGP has had three um, allergy uh, credited training things. The e-learning e course up in Newcastle, they did a practical training day. They've got the allergy education, which is Thermo Fisher's online, which they've given RCGP accreditation to. They've put it on the RCGP website. So hugely positive. The curriculum, we're and I don't want to say too much because it, it almost seems you know, unbelievable after so many years of trying to get it changed. Suddenly we're in a position where it might actually be about to be so 
So we're, we're going through discussions at the moment with the RCGP about the curriculum, um, and uh, certainly the work of the NASG has been hugely influential. I must mention Liz Anger, who's been doing a lot of the discussions with Steve Walsh at the RCGP. Um, lots of work has gone to that, but again, suddenly real progress, which is brilliant. Um, and clinical priorities spotlight scheme, we're hoping, so we had um, uh, Professor um, Hannah Smith and uh, Aziz Sheikh, who were um, clinical champions for allergy, a number of years ago now, they, they did this clinical champions program to, to really try and pick up conditions that might have otherwise been swept off the radar. They're doing it again called clinical priorities, and there's another one-year thing called the spotlight scheme for the RCGP to really put some weight in education behind certain conditions and diseases. And we're, we're hopeful, we're, we're not through it yet, but we're, it's all sounding very hopeful in the college that allergy is going to be one of them. So really, really good stuff. So uh, yeah, that's the question. You know, are we helping in general practice to, to meet this great unmet need? And I think the answer is not quite yet. <coughs> We're not there yet, but it's getting a lot better. It really, really is. I think GPs are paying attention. I think we're getting huge amounts of support that wasn't there before, and the education is suddenly out there and accessible. So I'm quite positive that things are just going to get better and better. Very. Right, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Matt. Really uh, excellent talk, um, and probably quite eye-opening for a lot of people in the room. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I know, you know, I talk to parents, and my explanation for it, for this, is that you know we've got this. Well, for, for centuries we didn't have allergy. Essentially, we had asthma, eczema, and rhinitis, as you said, and we have these these organ-based specialties, yeah. and so you go off in different directions and. In, so in our generation, there's no food allergy, but suddenly in our children's generation, 10% of them have got food allergy, and a percentage of those have anaphylaxis. Yeah. So suddenly we're having to deal with all these small people with anaphylaxis and food allergy risk, and none of us are prepared for it. Um, so I'm wondering whether we need to start sooner and actually train all doctors when they're at medical school. So Absolutely. Do, do you have yeah. thoughts on that? Or? Well, yeah, I'm sure like, like myself, you were trained in sort of type 1 to 4 plus maybe 5 hypersensitivity. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a while since I was in medical school, so I don't know how far... You're probably better placed to, to tell me how things are at Cambridge. But well, we have, have um, Cam Cambridge students coming and sitting in my clinic, and they've just come out of PATH finals. So they can, they can spout like an immunology textbook at me, and I'm looking at them like, what's that got to do with the real world? Nothing, virtually nothing. So actually, we need some clinical, good, sensible clinical allergy um, training in, in medical schools. We do, but I think as well, it, it, we've got to focus on the, the people who enter GP training because so many of these patients, will, you know, their first port of call is general practice. Yeah. That's where they first come with the question of... And, and nowadays, it, the great thing is, it's usually, am I allergic? It, it was, I'm sure, for years, I don't know what happened to, to my child. It, I, you know, it seemed very odd. And now food allergy is much more on people's radar, and they, they, patients do tend to come in and they tend to ask the question straight away. And I was very um, engaged by the, the screen share, which had a lot of not so good things about the percentage in the survey of general practice, but the fact that 90% of patients are getting referred is a huge step forward. Yeah. Thank you. Can, I, can we have some questions, please? Hazel at the back there. Hi, Hazel. I, well, I think listen, you know, is always the most important thing. Sometimes one of the biggest problems is getting that patient and that, the GP together. So I think the, the listening process and also making our GPs aware of how dangerous that period is. I mean, you know, I go around trying to send everyone links to take the kit because I think, and I, I really find it hard to watch that film because I think the message is so powerful. And I haven't ever seen anyone watch it, especially among my colleagues, who initially, you go see them go through the action of, this is overkill. And then you see their face change, actually, it probably isn't. 
and the, the, you see the concern afterwards because it, it just brings it home in such a, a, a beautiful way. So I think it's, it's the it's getting that communication between the patient and the family and the GP, which sometimes isn't there, but also for us as GPs to be aware how important that group is and how things can so easily go terribly wrong at that age. Yes, and next door to Hazel has another question. Thank you. Sort of half following on from that, I spend a lot of time doing training in GP surgeries. And one of the connections that I find frequently doesn't seem to be made is GPs make an assumption that the patient is still under the care of the immunology clinic and they therefore don't yeah. check things. Yeah. No, I, you're absolutely right. And it, it, it's, it's that one of that, those difficulties in general practice of, you know, if I see a patient with rheumatoid arthritis who's under the rheumatologist, how much am I meant to do? And how, where, where does the shared care path, where does that, that boundary stop? And my view is it doesn't stop, it is shared care. You know, we should do what we feel and what the patient in partnership feels is right for them at that time. And we should engage with our secondary and tertiary care colleagues as part of that, that sort of partnership, not to draw that line between what they do and what I do. And that, I think, goes back to the, the idea of, of GPs for, for many years saying, oh, I'm not comfortable prescribing an adrenaline injector. I think you should ask the, your specialist clinic to prescribe it. That's no longer so much the case because there's so many people having these. But in a way, that's almost pushed us the other way. People are doing it nonchalantly and, oh, you just need another injector. Um, not thinking, hang on, why do you need another injector? I only gave you one last month. Have you actually used it? Or have you, you know, what's happened? I better give you a call. So it, it, it's just all those little facets. And generally, GPs are very good at that. They're very good at complex context, if I can, yeah, I did say that correctly. Um, and very good at picking out a strand that might otherwise be missed. But the pressure, I think, from the number of patients, it's so easy for, for these things to get left out. But I think you're absolutely right. So, so related to that, you, you're highly motivated to treat patients with allergy. We're all in the room because we like allergy and we're interested in it. But there are deep pockets of primary care where that interest yeah. doesn't exist or can't exist because there's yeah. no resources. So do you think the approach should be more carrot, um, you know, get people interested, be soft with them, fluffy, or is it more stick, or is it more make these kind of methotrexate type alerts for everything that they do in allergy practice. It's yeah, kind they, of a, a red line for them. Well, when we did the drug allergy guidance, and David Cousins, who is this extraordinary um, head of pharmacology, uh, he, he had data on the length, the average length of time it takes a doctor, both in primary and secondary care, this is, to override an alert that appears on their computerized system. And it's less than half a second on average the time it takes us to go big red box, ignore. So I think putting more big red boxes probably isn't the way forward. I would say if we look at how far we've come in just a matter of a few years, we're not there yet, we're nowhere near there yet, but we've come such a long way and we're moving further forward all the time. I kind of think we probably have to just be patient and let it happen, yeah. which is not necessarily good for patients, but we are getting there. You come a long way, and it feels like you've done you know, a, a ton of work, but that last bit of work with the unengageable GPs might be the hardest. Yeah. It's a bit like trying to engage the unengageable teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> Hazel's smiling again. There's a question there. Hi, I'm Carol Cooper, I'm a GP, and uh, as part of the annual requirement for um, resuscitation training, we do actually have to learn about anaphylaxis. But the trouble is, you're only taught about anaphylaxis in the emergency situation. Exactly, yeah. But I would have thought that would be an ideal opportunity to get information to the GPs attending for their emergency training. I, I think you're absolutely right. It would be a great opportunity. But you and I both know what that resuscitation training is actually like. It's usually booked, you know, a few sessions for each practice to fit everybody in, because everyone has to do it each year, every member of staff. It's kind of, you know, in your lunch break, and you're, oh, I'm running late, I'll run up to, to do it. And you've usually been given about a half hour window to do all of the algorithms and demonstrate and do your chest compressions on Rosassiani and so on and so forth. And it, so if we, if we asked GPs to say, actually, we need another 15 minutes of your time, 
that's going to be a challenge because yeah, we're so yes, time Yes, it pressured. is. I actually go to a private hospital which gives a two-hour free session to local ah, GPs. Lovely. And obviously that's great. They do it for a reason, clearly. Yeah, yeah. But you do get a, a reasonable length of time to have the training and to have hands-on approach, and it is geared to clinicians, that session. Sure. So it's not within the practice. That's brilliant. Another question, yes. Can you just hold on for the microphone? Thank you. I know you said about not having more pop-ups, but we had an issue recently. Well, we've got an issue in our area in that a lot of the consultants are discharging children with, I'm going to say, bog-standard nut allergy, and they've got adrenaline injector to the care of the GPs, and they'll review them maybe when they start secondary school. But we had an incident where a, a family hadn't had any update training. So the school was having annual training, and the mum actually injected a hand with the EpiPen, and she hadn't been retrained. Is there something on that pop-up when you prescribe adrenaline to ask whether the family's been trained? I can tell you exactly what would happen if... Well, it's very cynical of me, but I think what would happen is you'd have a whole bunch of people clicking yes. And that's it. And I know this because when I, whenever I go and do talks to GPs, which I try and do as often as I can, I always take a handful of pens with me, trainer pens with me. And when you put them out on the table, you see this little furrow of concern on people's faces. That, oh, God, I'm not going to be asked to come up and demonstrate, am I? Um, because if you ask the room, does everyone know how to use this? Oh, yes, of course I do. Yeah, brilliant. Show me. No. You know, it, it, and, but we see the same with patients. I, with every single patient I see or I give the injector to, I go through it with them. And I would say, good, th and I'm sure everyone would reflect this, a good third of the time, they're not confident because they've either not been trained for a while and it's not as fresh as it should be, or sometimes, sadly, because they've never been trained. My, my big target, I have to say, is A&E departments um, who, who discharge a lot of patients with pens without training. Um, so uh, that, that's one where I, I'd like to have a look. Um, we've had quite a few parents being told to look on YouTube um, yeah. on how to give it. I, I'm very much of the feeling that you have to have a go with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I always say to people, get your own trainer pen. They're, you know, go on the website, they're free, register your own pen so you get the expiry alerts and, uh, and, and have your trainer pen and then get everyone to play with it. Yeah, people who turn up in clinic with a trainer pen themselves tend to know how to use it. Yeah. And I don't know if that's because they're the better motivate, motivated people who get those, or the pen actually helps them. Right? But either way, they seem to do it very well. That's a good idea. Hazel again. Yes. I just wanted to add to that. Um, one of our fatal cases involved um, a family where there'd been a recall of one kind of auto-injector, and the GP, which also was connected with the pharmacy, so they were um, in a village you know, working together, um, they, called, they called the parents and said, you're going to have to use this other kind of auto-injector and we'll show you how to do it. Um, but on the day at the time, uh, the first pen still went in the dad's thumb. So familiarity, what the message I'm sort of saying is that changing an auto-injector, and it happened to me because I changed mine, um, my GP then sent a message saying you can't have this until you promise me you're going to get the trainer and go online and all the rest of it which i thought was you know i mean she knows who i am so yeah. but i think that's the proper way to do things yeah changing a pen is really dangerous it's, we know that from evidence it, it is it happened as uh, andy will remember it happened in cambridgeshire when they suddenly decided to say there is one pen we want the whole of the Cambridge to CCG to use, which, which didn't, fortunately didn't last long, but it caused a bit of a kerfuffle. I should add that one of the difficulties we have is I work in Jersey, and Jersey is not part of the NHS. It has a state-funded hospital, which works just like an NHS hospital. But primary care is private. It's a co-payment system. So when you go to your GP, you pay a bit, and the state pays a bit. So there's a positive disincentive for people to come in for something like training, because they think they're going to get charged. And often we have to ring them up and say, look, come in and see me and I won't charge you. But you actually have to say, I'm not going to charge you for this, for some people to come in. So that, that's an added barrier for us that's unique to Channel Islands um, and obviously to, to Southern Ireland as well in getting our engagement with patients. We don't have that, that free access that, uh, that we have in the NHS. Yes, lady there.
I'm going to mention another gap which I see when I'm doing my GP training frequently, which is, again, um, the doctor assumes that the pharmacist is going to train the patient. Yeah. And also, when I do what you do and hand out my trainer pens, and everyone's going, oh, is it real? Is it going to hurt? Um, and you doctors need to remember it does hurt, actually, when you give it. <laughs> um, very frequently, a proportion of the people in the room, given that I've just demonstrated it, will still put it in their thumbs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, after 11 years as a GP, I've learned to become the most incredibly cynical and mistrustful of absolutely everyone everywhere. And as a result, I, I, you know, I never believe anyone's going to do it for me, so I, I just do it myself. But you're absolutely right. That there's, and I think this goes back to the secondary care um, thing. That, that there's always the assumption that so, if, if you're slightly sketchy about it in your own mind, if it haven't, hasn't been hammered into you from an early stage, that the assumption that someone else will do it is very appetizing. Because you think, well, I, I'm not sure I can do that, but I don't really want to say I'm not sure I can do that, and I'm going to hope someone else has done it beautifully for me. And that's not just in allergic care, that's in diabetes, that's in asthma, that's in, in COPD. You know, inhaler technique for patients with COPD is, is so important. And yet we see lots of patients not receiving that vital training. So it, it's something that, and I think this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about we, train, we should train our doctors from practicality. You know, if you're, if you're going to be giving an inhaler or giving a, an injector or giving an insulin uh, device or whatever it might be, we, we need to know how to use it ourselves before we're able to give it out. Okay, thanks. That's really informative, Matt. And uh, thank you for all the questions. Well done. Thank you.